So today we have managed to get to our final large scale picture of the universe. All right, so I want to review for you sort of where we've come from. Now instead of, because we finally have arrived, right? Um, and for those of you who are watching this on recording, last lecture, uh, these chapters don't mean much, so we'll just cross out the number. Last lecture is 6-1. If, uh, if you happen to be watching this in a semester other than 2020, you can, of course, ignore the, uh, <laughs> the date. But for those of you in the pandemic semester, um, that will be our final in-class meeting. And I will talk to you uh, after lecture. I'll answer questions about what you have due. I answered a few before the lecture. Um, and we can talk about that. But let's go over our scale, sort of how, we've, um, how we got here, where we're coming from. So first, the first thing we have to do in, that, that we did in class, and we spent about a third of the class, which is a lot of class time, really, um, describing how measurements are made, what the, the, talking about the basic basic physics of the interactions of light and matter, right? And we talked about physics and science, or we talked about, or let me see here. here we talked about science and physics. And I've, all, I've often said that this is the, the structure by which we draw conclusions. That's why we have to know this, right? Because then we presented information on the scales of our universe. This let us explore the uh, planetary scale. Right? And then we went to the stellar scale. I think there's an R there, stellar, stellar. Ah, eh, someone will, it'll, my, my spelling uh, insufficiencies will be saved for posterity. We have the galactic scale. And now here we have the cosmic scale, or the scale of the universe. Universe, all right. Never claimed I could stop. So, we finally got here, and we've seen that not only are we here now, but that the uh, measurements we took and our way of collecting data and drawing conclusions built in between each of these scales, right? We had our standard candles, such as um, the speed of light, uh, all the way to uh, white dwarf supernova that give us, you know, either a fixed velocity in the case of the speed of light or a fixed power in the case of things like Cepheid variable stars and white dwarf supernova that give us the scale of the universe, all right? And we also, we, you know, a few things about the universe that we want to, that we alluded to in our previous chapters. Uh, one, it's expanding. And I think I asked you this before, but if the universe is expanding and everything's getting farther, observations tell us that all the galaxies are getting farther and farther away as times go forward, if you rewind time, what would you expect? I guess to put this another way, would do you, if you go backward in time, would you expect every all the galaxies that are moving farther and farther away from us to be closer together, closer to us, or farther away from us in the past? What do you think? Think about a balloon. If you take a picture of you blowing up a balloon, points are moving farther apart. If you rewind that video, are the points coming closer together, moving farther apart? Feel free to use that text box. Closer, good. They'll be moving closer together. So the idea is, is that if you go far enough back in time, everything must be at the same point, all right? And so in this sense, the universe is a lot like the surface of a balloon. Not the volume of a balloon, but the surface of a balloon where it's growing and expanding and getting bigger. 
okay? So, um, that's, that is uh, one thing we know. And because, because of that, if you play it backwards and it gets smaller, it looks like it all started at one point and expands out. The beginning of this expansion is called the Big Bang Theory. Not the television show, but the, the theory of how the universe was uh, born. And I want to remind you, as I always do, that theory here doesn't mean it's an abstract idea that may or may not be true. It's, it's very true. It's not, there's still a lot of open questions and interesting questions about the Big Bang Theory. It is not a finished product. However, it is not a merely a interesting guess. There is evidence that supports this model of the universe. And so far, this is the consensus model. An important thing to understand about consensus, consensus can change it, and does change. But remember the criteria for that consensus to change lies not in, in uh, feeling or anger or, or opinion. It lies in analyzing evidence in science and physics. All right, when new evidence stops answering, when the Big Bang Theory answers less, starts answering less and less questions and another theory answers more and more of them, that theory will then supersede the Big Bang Theory. Or the Big Bang Theory, much like, you know, a, the opposite case of this is something like the standard model of particle physics, which is a theory that has where the evidence converges more and more and more as time goes on. Uh, every experiment seems to verify the standard model of particle physics, making it pretty much the most successful, one of the most successful models and most thoroughly tested scientific models of all time. Um, so anyway, looking at that, let's get some ideas of what the universe looks like at the large scale. And so you remember as we looked at the, um, I need to make my window smaller because everything's too far away. Hold on. This is getting a little ridiculous. All right, that's good. Okay. So this is essentially a picture and a baby picture at that of a small universe. All right, our universe as a baby. And we can observe something. There's an object we can observe called the cosmic microwave background radiation, otherwise known as CMB. This is an independent observation of the universe, it's, or this is not independent, it's, this is an observation of the universe itself independent of galaxies and things like that. Um, and in fact, there are huge issues in cosmology in which our observations of galaxies and stars don't match up with our observations of the CMB and creating gaps. And as we've talked about the James Webb Telescope, the James Webb Telescope should give us information in this gap in between the CMB and the universe and, the, uh, um, and our current uh, predictions based on uh, stellar and galactic models. So the CMB is crucially important. And what you're looking at is a microwave, is a microwave, this, the cosmic microwave background radiation picture here. And as you'll notice, the density is nearly uniform. The colors here, even though it doesn't look uniform, the variance in these colors from the darkest to the brightest is about 10, one part in 10 to the fifth. Uh, I think it's something like that. It's very small. I was, I was shocked when I learned how small it was. Um, so the uni universe is very nearly uniform. A uniform universe is not a great thing. A uniform universe would very, very likely end up just being photons. And uh, while well, that might sound interesting, uh, that if all photons means no room for planets and people and uh, students taking courses and doing whatever else we're doing uh, with our lives. Um, but we can get this information, this data. Uh, we, we can get that, look at this picture. And so now what we'll, we'll really be looking at is, is what does the CMB tells us? Well, it tells us a lot of things. And, but most importantly, it's used in conjunction with the standard model of particle physics to create a picture of the universe during its early lifetime. And strange things happen in the universe in its early lifetime. Okay, we're going to talk about a few of those. The universe is a strange place. So we already saw that. So the thing is, is you go back, you use 
the standard model of particle physics, standard model. Right? You can use the standard model, which is which basically tells us how particles react in particle accelerators. We can use those to do experiments to look at what a sort of the universe might have looked like in a more hot and dense state, right? Because remember, think about this. Let's look at three spheres, all right? As we get smaller, the mass stays the same of each of these, right? They all have the same mass, but the density, which is given by m over v, right? As v gets smaller, the density as this goes down, this increases. If you don't believe me, take the number, grab your phone and open your calculator app and divide the number one by um, 100, right? So one over 100 is equal to 0.1 or 0 0.01, right? One over 10 is equal to 0.1. You'll notice 0.1 is bigger than 0.01. 1 over 1 is equal to 1. 1 is bigger than 0.1. All right? Now, if you look at 1 over 0.1, right, we're making the volume smaller. That's going to equal 10. And similarly, 1 over 0 0.01 is going to equal, um, is going to equal uh, 100. All right? And now you probably heard of something in, you probably remember from elementary school where it says you are not allowed to divide by zero, right? Well, the correct way to attempt to divide by zero is to recognize that as x goes to zero, this isn't to say that one over zero is infinity because infinity is not a well-defined number. But as you get closer, this is basically a very fancy math way of saying that as you get closer and closer and closer and closer to zero, the quantity of one over x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and in a sense that doesn't stop at a number. <clears throat> All right? So, so as we look at these spheres, as we get smaller back in time, as we go in this graph, uh, and we can use, we can look at our... Um, our models of the universe, and our models of the universe can take us back to, oh, I'd say somewhere in the here-ish, and, um, and then we can extrapolate from here and test other parts of the standard model for particle physics, which has not, again, been, uh, we can, you know, it's a very, very strong model, the standard model. We can extrapolate back to where the standard model doesn't make predictions anymore, which is at this point here, or 10 to the minus 40, two seconds when the universe is 10 to the minus 42 seconds old. At that point, standard model doesn't make predictions. Standard model breaks down. So that's some interesting math lessons. But let's take a look at this, uh, this little graph here. And you'll notice we have these breaks. That should indicate to you that there's some that this isn't as straight or well-shaped as one might think. And I want you to take a look at the axes of this graph. You will very rarely see a graph like this in existence. In fact, this is the only place you'll see a graph with these crazy types of axes. First of all, none of the scales are linear, right? Linear is what you're used to. It's not even exponential or logarithmic. It's exponential in, uh, it's, diff it's exponential but in different exponents on each side. Here, each tick is two orders of magnitude, right? So this is exponential. It's 10 to the 2 bigger. You multiply by 100 each time. So basically what that says is that each of these is only, each tick is only 1% of the preceding tick, right? So 10 to the 30th is only 1% of 10 to the 32. 10 to the 28th is only 1% of 10 to the 30th. So you basically knock off 99% each time you go down. So that should give you an idea of the scale. And to go from 1 to 10 to the 32 is an enormous coverage of scale and temperature. All right? Let's keep in mind some, some basic things. This is about where uh, this is the scale at which we live. All right? 
this is about the scale of a hot star. Hot star surface. About here is where fusion happens, or H fusion. And then you'll notice that we go higher from there. All right. So also look at the time scale. I want you to notice we go up by five orders of uh, ten orders of magnitude. So this is one billion times or ten billion times smaller actually than this tick, which is ten billion times smaller than this tick, which is ten billion times smaller than this tick. Okay. Um, so this is quite a big whopping amount, but I want to show you something about this graph that's interesting. A lot of stuff happened in the first second after the Big Bang. All right, you'll notice in the first second, we get more towards predictability. And I want you to think about how long the second is. I want you to count out a few of them. Okay? So count out a few of those seconds. Now, in each of those seconds, the universe cooled. In one second, the universe cooled from 10 to the 32 degrees all the way to a much cooler 10 to the 10 degrees. So in order for that to happen, a period of rapid expansion is thought to have taken place. And that will be, and inflation is the main idea behind um, the Big Bang Theory. And inflation itself has its detractors and legitimate detractors, not just all, not just I saw it on Ancient Aliens. However, it answers it right now suffices as the simplest explanation that solves the most problems. So in order to be overthrown or to be falsified, it would have to start the, 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 the superseding explanation that comes after inflation, right, would have to answer more questions than inflation. Um, and, you know, you know, would, would on, on the half, would on the, on the whole have to explain more than inflation, right, while leaving less unknown. So that is the criteria for, for developing uh, this field, which is why it takes so darn, it takes a lot of work, okay? So uh, part, basically what we're gonna talk about in this chapter is sort of the evidence we see for inflation, we're gonna talk about inflation, and we're gonna talk about what the standard model predicts about the age of the universe. So we'll do the latter first, right? We'll talk about how the standard model predicts, um, let me be sure that's actually true. Uh, yes. Uh, I think we talk a little bit about it. No, no, no. I'm right. Yeah. Um, so we talk about that. We talk about CMB and then we talk about, yeah, and then we talk about inflation. Okay. So question so far, this is just the intro. We're going to go into everything in a lot more detail. All right. So I just want to give everyone 30 seconds to, to ask something. Okay, good. Well, so we talked about weird stuff that can happen in that early universe, all right? So uh, photons can be, we've, we've talked about electrons and things, or we've talked about particles colliding in fusion to give off energy, right? And we've talked a little bit about antimatter. Well, I'm not sure we've talked about antimatter. Um, but basically, in the beginning of the universe, the um, matter and antimatter were created in equal parts, and they were created and destroyed very rapidly. So what is antimatter? Antimatter has the properties of regular matter, but the charge is reversed. So when we look at an atom, say, let's look at a helium nucleus, all right? That has two protons two neutrons, and there's two electrons orbiting out here, 
All right, we'll call those little ones electrons. So in our standard, you know, in our standard model or well, with standard particles, the ones we're used to, right? Electrons are negatively charged. That's a minus sign for negative. And protons have positive charge. Okay, now, uh, so this is exactly like if you've ever played with static electricity and you've shocked one of your the smaller people in your family, um, usually, or were shocked by a bigger person in your family. That's usually how that goes. I never really pulled the wool over my brother and my cousins with the static electricity. I usually just ended up getting, getting zapped. But they were all like five years older than me, so that's probably why. Anyhow, so this is regular matter. Now for antimatter, which is fun stuff, it's the stuff that is often used in science fiction for uh, fun time to explain away just about, well, a lot of things and make it sound real. Antimatter is a, a real thing, and I want you to understand that uh, it's been cre you can create antimatter in particle accelerators. It is very expensive and very unstable, but it has been created, characterized, and it exists. And if you want to store it, you need fairly powerful mag magnetic trapping. Yes, Margarito. How long does it last? So usually only, um, if it's not magnetically trapped, it only lasts, um, I mean, it wouldn't last very long at all, probably a couple a tenth of a nanosecond. Um, I'm not sure, um, that a good question. I'm going to look up on one of my browsers now, so hopefully I don't disappear. But let's see what the record storage for antimatter is. How long can antimatter be stored in the magnetic field? Because I've, how long can antimatter be stored? All right, so physicists in the International Alpha Collaboration at CERN in Geneva have succeeded in storing a total of 309 uh, hydrogen atoms for as long as 1,000 seconds, so almost 17 minutes. So that's how, that's, that's the record as far as I can see. So pretty unstable. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so, uh, so a thousand seconds is what they've done so far. And keep in mind that's, th that's 309 atoms of the stuff. So that's not very much. Uh, keep in mind that typically when you're talking about small objects in the, um, you, know, you know, very small microscopic uh, entities, you're generally talking about somewhere on the order of 10 to the 20 atoms, all right, or 10 to the 19th atoms. So, and here they're talking about storing 10 to the 2 antimatter uh, atoms. I want to erase this so I can go over what antimatter is specifically, though, because I didn't do that. I got excited about the, talking about it. Um, so let's delete this. Okay, so in antimatters, you have something called the positron, which is like an electron, but charge is positive. And then you have an antiproton. And that would be, um, that's like a proton. But now it's not obvious here, but there's a ton of particle properties that differentiate the electron and the proton. Uh, the proton, for instance, is about 100,000 times more massive than the electron. The proton is tightly bound in the nucleus. The electron is free to move about the atom. So the fact that their charges get inverted is a pretty big deal. And an anti-hydrogen atom would have two antiprotons, two neutrons, 
and it would have these two positrons floating about. Okay? And that's what anti-healing would look like. Now, the universe, according to the standard model, should have created matter and antimatter in equal quantities. And during the turbulent times of the early universe, uh, for instance, not only could matter, the energies are so high that not only will um, particles that uh, are created from gamma radiation form to uh, have massively energetic gamma radiation, but the gamma radiation itself can spontaneously form particles. Now, I want you to think about this because this is a weird thing to think about. So basically, the very first atoms created popped in and out of virtually nothing. So the energy, the energy that was available to the universe was, was converting between light and matter, and light and matter, very rapidly, extremely rapidly. Uh, and according to the standard model, and one of the most outstanding mysteries, is where did all the extra antimatter go? So the standard model, again, predicts that the universe should have formed matter and antimatter in equal amounts, which means that the universe should be uh, uniform, and remember what I said about uniform, that would be all photons, all right? And that it would just move out and none of this would have formed. However, it didn't. We see when we look at the universe, we see overwhelmingly matter and atoms arranged in the way we look at them, like so. And we don't see this. I'm going to create another color here. I'll create another color. We don't see this in nature. All right. So the question is, where did it all go? Another question is, why are why is there more of us than this? Where did the imbalance come from? So there have been investigations into that, including uh, investigations of the Higgs boson. Um, and people have made models to figure out, well, OK, so how much would you expect at random if we're a random amount? How much expected antimatter would you expect to be left over? And I thought that was the next slide. But um, if we don't get to it, um, no, oh no, we will get to it. You're going to be surprised at how many of these collisions happen, how many of these events happen for each subatomic particle. And you'll start to understand sort of the epic scale of the universe. Um, or at least the, the crazy scale of the universe. Because things, things get a little off the rails when we really start thinking about the birth of the universe. Um, it's just hard to wrap one's head around. So let's talk about how the Earth universe expanded through time. Now, pictures like this, again, a lot like our space-time pictures, are meant to break away from your sense of normal thinking. Because you have to understand something. You see this dark region out here? This dark region represents outside our comprehension. There's nothing here. And by nothing, I mean literal nothing. It's not volume that exists that we can move into, right? And again, I want to go back to our balloon. If you imagine blowing up a balloon, you know, you, if all of existence is on the surface of that balloon, then the surface just gets bigger. Now, as three-dimensional beings, we know the balloon is expanding in a third dimension, the two-dimensional surface is getting bigger and is expanding into a third dimension. And one of the solutions of general relativity that gives a nice expanding universe like the one we have posits that we are actually expanding into a spatial fourth dimension, right? That the universe itself is the surface of a 4D hypersphere, all right? That, again, answers some questions, but not enough to be... I would say it's almost mainstream. I wouldn't call it a mainstream scientific theory. But again, it's a thought, right? One would ask, well, if we use this, does this analogy hold? That's always a good question to ask. And the, the real answer to that is there's not enough experiments to conclude that. And there are other ideas that are just as plausible with as much experimental evidence. So it's not that it's a bad idea. It just doesn't distinguish itself from the other competing ideas. All right, and that's the important thing to think of. Now, so when we look back here um, at the Big Bang, you have to look at this and think of this as everything that exists. The volume of the universe is all here. There is no out here. 
all right? They've done a really job in making this uh, kind of scary, the, the, the dark. It's one of the darkest darks I think you can get on a computer screen. Oh, no, I see some bleed through. Never mind. Uh, I see a, a, a border there for the picture. Almost fooled me. So if you look here, we have sort of the instant the universe popped into being, for lack of a better word, and then how it evolves in time. All right? So you'll notice that our baby picture, we start to look at the universe. It looks like this at around 380,000 years old. All right? And then you'll notice that we have a billion years old. Uh, we start to see the beginnings of galaxies and stars. Now, I want to point out these very important. There's a reason why this starts at billion and not 500 million, 250 million, and that's because our current telescopes only go back here. And this, this region from 380,000 to 1 billion, for the most part, represents what we call the dark ages of the universe. And we call them the dark ages of the universe because we don't have the telescopes to illuminate them. Once we have uh, James Webb up, this will no longer be dark. We will be able to see the light, okay? Uh, so again, you'll notice that the web, the cosmic web expands further and further until we get to the galaxies and uh, galactic structure we see today. All right. So you'll notice that this is space and time. And again, this picture is meant to pull, pull you out of your intuitive space and remind you that this is not this, you know, the space and space and time as we look at them. Uh, are really not how we think of it, how we experience them, okay? So, all right. Any, I, I'm going to ask if there are any questions. I know for a fact there's got to be questions because I've been teaching this for the better part of 10 years. I still have questions. So, so I know they're there. They might be hard to form, though. But give it a shot. See what you, see what you, you know, they're, they're, we, we, we covered a lot here. And again, we're going to go into detail from the Big Bang and what conditions were like as we go through time. So we're going to see that. That's what's coming up next. It, it is interesting, that's for sure. All right, feel free to just chime in or ask them um, at any time. We've got plenty of time. As I said to those who have um, who may have just joined us, I fully expect that we will end, we will probably end early today. Uh, mainly, I don't want to cover too much without people here, and the fact of the matter is, is I don't have a terrible amount left to cover. So, um, I used to do, to give you a sense, I used to do this chapter, the next chapter, and an activity in one three-hour class. Um, and the next chapter is sort of a lot of the big payoff. So, so, uh, so I don't want to do that when I only have six people here. I want to let people ask questions. Um, and plus, I want to do some videos in the next part, too, which I've, I've added recently. Um, so what is what? You asked, what is that, Katya? What are we, what are you pointing at? What, this? No, this is, no, this isn't a telescope. This is a uh, diagram of the evolution of the universe and it looks at it at the entirety of the universe in this flat pancake structure so this disk shrinks the farther back you go in time okay and you'll notice it shrinks very rapidly at this point here down into a singularity um, and again the sing, you know, black holes and the Big Bang are the two places where we come across this word singularity. Um, a singularity 
Hold on. A singularity right this this one is time this arrow is time and these ones say space that might be hard to see but a singularity implies an infinity infinities are always suspect So So yeah, so there's basically this. Um, yeah. So black holes and the Big Bang are two places where infinities happen. There are a lot of interesting ideas that um, that connect black holes to um, to the Big Bang with uh, one observation saying that for some models, our, our observations of the universe with everything moving faster and faster away from us and being causally disconnected in time, except for local areas where we are, um, look, there, there are features of that expanding universe that mirror what theorists predict the inside of a black hole would look like. So, you know, if you want some deep, scary thoughts for the day, um, there is, there is, and again, this is highly speculative. It's hypothetical, not a theory. There's a difference. So one hypothesis that comes in and out of vogue um, is the idea that black holes birth baby universes, right? They take the information from this universe as it collapses in and birth out other universes. Um, but at the same time, as interesting as that is, what may be more interesting is that our standard model um, allows for the creation of our universe from nothing, which is also very strange, but there's, the, the way I want to say this is, is that the, um, the hy hypotheticals in that situation don't break any known laws of physics or, and are consistent with processes we've observed in the laboratory. So uh, particle fluctuations arriving in and out of existence, um, there's a lot of evidence for that. There's a lot of strong supporting evidence for that. There's a vacuum pressure, which seems to indicate this process is happening. We can see, we, we don't see the particles doing this directly, but we see the effects of this happening, that, that, that we're the best one of the more, the more popular explanations for a, a certain vacuum pressure called the Casimir effect, which is experimentally verifiable, is that these particles pop in and out of existence. And so, and the, those particles popping in and, in and out of existence do not break known, they can, it is possible for this to happen in ways that do not break the laws of quantum mechanics. And if it's possible for that to happen, then it's possible for anything to pop in and out of existence at very exceedingly small time scales. And as, and until you get down to what they, Called the Planck time, and what they've been able, to, what what some cosmologists have been able to, again, very hypothetically predict, is that um, uh, you know the the mass required for a universe and the time scales that are required could appear out of nothing and and launch an inflation event because big, creating the universe we see. So again, did the universe appear out of nothing? We're not at a place to conclusively say that. Could it have? Yes, it does not break, it, that, there's a process by which that happens, it does not break any known laws of physics. Could we be the product of a black hole from some other universe? Also a possibility. There are a lot of possibilities, but again, each one has as much evidence as another, right? So even though something sounds good or it resonates with you, that's not enough. And th those hypotheticals, I said, are really darn interesting and compelling to think about, right? They're very different, right? One has us coming from a very specific source that is very much not nothing. One has us coming from nothing, and there are others. But again, we are getting to the end of the road, so that means many, much of what we talk about is more speculative. And part of the job of scientists, of physicists, 
really not just astrophysicists, it's to design experiments where we can rule out certain interpretations, where we can rule out those ideas and say, well, this one can't happen because evidence, it makes a prediction that is that fails, right? And that's what, in that sense, this is the most, in my mind, that's why this is the most exciting field to study. This is why, I've, you know, this is what keeps me going. It's not why I got into physics, but thinking about questions like this and reading about work that comes out like this and being in this world where people are answering these questions is why I've dedicated my life to this field. Um, and it's pretty awesome and neat stuff comes out all the time. Uh, and people's ideas, you know, crazy wacky ideas come out all the time too. Uh, so, so there's a lot going on here with the universe, but it's important that as you hear this stuff, because you will hear this stuff, that there's a lot of explanations for how the universe came to be. Some of them are better than others, but basically the good ones don't break laws of physics. All right, the really good ones, right, will have experimental, will, will propose experiments. And in the future, those experiments may be able to be realized that can remove certain ideas for the, from the birth of the universe, how it happened or didn't happen. Okay, so fun times in physics. That's, that's really where, where we are. And again, this all comes back to this idea that infinities are suspect, because again, infinity is... True infinity is terrifying. I mean, it's unimaginably, it's unimaginably, unimaginably big. Um, and it's, it's, it's always disconcerting. But the idea does pop in. Um, and there are all sorts of fascinating consequences to infinity. Uh, there are consequences to big numbers, to tell you the truth. But there are, um, but infinity is a scary, is a scary proposition. I think for a lot of reasons, which I will go into next week because that's when the uh, discussion of infinity is a little more appropriate. But suffice to say, um, if you're wondering what keeps me up at night and prevents me from getting sleep, it is pretty much this idea here of infinity. And hopefully once I explain to you why it keeps me up, it won't keep you up. You'll just be able to go, he's crazy. I don't want to think about that. Um, so let's go and look at each of these, of the parts of the universe, these, uh, you know, from the big bang to the release of this energy is what we're really going to concentrate on. And then we're going to see that a lot happened in that first 380,000 years. We're actually going to see a lot happen in the first five minutes. Um, and then to understand how we get from this, this tiny little point to the galactic cosmos and the structure we see. All right, so let's, let's move on. All right, so when we talk about the earliest eras of the universe, we talk about the kinds of forces in the universe. Later eras are defined by kinds of particles present in the universe. So at the early times, we'll talk about forces, and in the later eras, we'll talk about kinds of particles in the universe. Now, because we've learned about general relativity, we're gonna have some real questions about the way this is set up, all right? Because you'll notice gravity is here on our force chart. But general relativity tells us that gravity can behave like a force, but isn't really a force. It's the curvature of space-time. And my personal opinion is that thinking of gravity as a force may have let us down some, some problematic roads. Um, but I understand where people are coming from. There's this, uh, but you'll know, but the, the forces we really talk about here, fundamental forces of nature are electromagnetism, uh, the weak force, which is the nuclear weak force is responsible for nuclear decay, and the strong force, which is responsible for holding nuclei together. Okay? Now, you'll notice this all started in the 19th century, this kind of thinking, because if we, if we put on our, our 1820 physics caps, if we go back to, to, you know, um, to that period in the history of science, natural scientists or physicists, I don't want to select everything. Okay, good. Oh, wow, that actually worked. Um, what we'll see is that there were, there were two fields of study. People studied electric forces. And magnetic forces. Okay. 
these were two different things. In the eight, by the mid 19th century, these had been combined by Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell into the electromagnetic force. And it was through thinking of this electromagnetic force that it was seen that these two seemingly independent forces were two sides of the same coin, all right? They were part of the same more fundamental phenomenon, which we call electromagnetism. Now, in, the, in those early days, there was just electromagnetic magnetism. Electro. and gravity. And Albert Einstein actually spent most of his life trying to combine these two forces without knowing about the existence of the strong or the weak force for much of that time. Uh, so he was obviously working on a, um, with very much incomplete data, because uh, he didn't even know about two fundamental forces of nature, which were not really um, verified until uh, the nuclear properties of the atom uh, were not, or, and nuclear reactions were not really observed experimentally until the, uh, you know, the 30s and 40s. And then fission and fusion, well, fusion wasn't, ex wasn't made, like the fusion bomb wasn't made until the 60s, and uh, uh, fission wasn't accomplished until the mid-30s, so 1930s, that is. So, uh, and again, Albert Einstein's real act, very much his, his active years were from about um, uh, after relativity. He worked on general relativity um, until, and was, he, he finished it in 19, the, the, the beginnings of it in the 1960, in 1916, but Einstein's active years after his famous contributions were really from like the 20s to the mid 40s. So, so, um, and he died in 1955. So he was more of a celebrity by the 40s when they discovered all this stuff. So anyhow, this idea of combining forces has always been a, a desirable one, but it didn't work until in the 70s or 80s, I believe, the weak force and electromagnetic force, you could create the conditions in an accelerator where they became one phenomenon known as the electroweak force. So we actually were able to further combine forces into the electroweak force. That's not a question mark. That's supposed to be a check. All right. And so the standard model predicts that at a temperature which we have not reached, right, this is one of the one outstanding predictions of the standard model, is that the strong force and the electroweak force will combine into this gut force, all right, grand unified theory force. So that's predicted by the standard model, but we've not been able to do that experimentally. So this is a very strong maybe. Here, combining gravity with this gut force, that's what we call a theory of everything or a string theory or loop quantum gravity. And it is inappropriate to call those theories. It should really be called, according to me, the string hypothesis and the loop quantum gravity hypothesis. They can be accepted as theories as soon as they make predictions. String theory, for all its uh, popularity, has not made a single experimental prediction. That makes it a hypothesis, a conjecture at worst, a hypothesis at best. It's had a ton of people working on it, but it remains in that, very much in that area. And unfortunately, most experiments actually... It's, it's, it's almost sort of worse. Most experiments sort of close the door on string theory more than lending hints that we just need to go a little further. Um, so, you know, it's, like I said, interesting times in physics. So let's see. I believe this goes through these, uh, these things here. So we, have, um, so we have our four known forces, again, strong, holds the atomic nuclei together. Weak facilitates nuclear decay, like in a fission reaction. Electromagnetic is your electric, magnetic, and uh, light, like photons, stuff like that. And then we have gravity. But remember, we use the word force as gravity 
because it's easier to say than talk about it in terms of space-time. These forces only ex we only understand these forces in flat space-times. We do not understand them in curved space-times. Gravity, we have understanding of in curved space-time, but we don't have a particle description of gravity. So it's I, I circle it a different color because I'm because again due to the ways it's looked at I just my spider sense tells me something's missing here. Um, so uh, da, da, da. all right. So again. We'll look through, they'll start combining this. Electro weak, we can make this in the lab. As I said before, this graphic is kind of nice. The gut is a maybe. Again, the standard model, which is very successful, right? Predicts all sorts of weird stuff that has been verified, like the Higgs boson. Maybe. Okay, but we haven't verified it. And then, of course, the super force. This is who knows, theory of everything. All right, that's where your string theories come in. So now I want to go through this graph or this set of eras of the universe. You'll notice we have the Planck era where all forces may have been unified. Um, and this is, this is the, you know, who knows era. All right. There is no theory of quantum gravity yet. And I'll remind you that quantum mechanics and gravity are inconsistent so imagine and I want to I want to I don't mind making this comparison that's the most one of the more fundamental comparisons in the uh, well it's, it's it's the easiest way I think to understand this fundamental disagreement in physics so consider not that line I propose for your consideration a straight line Now, quantum physics says that if you if you zoom into this line far enough, you will see discrete indivisible quanta. All right? And there is no definition in between them. They're just discrete parts, packets, all right? You can count them, one, two, three, four, five, all right? This is what we call a countable system. In general relativity, right? Basically, if you zoom in on a small section of the line, we'll call this QM, we'll call this GR. So we're looking, so in each of these lines, we're looking at, we'll use our blue pen, we're zooming in at a tiny little spot here, all right? Say we're, we're zooming in on this part, a, you know, 100 billion times, as far as we possibly can. And in quantum mechanics, you find eventually that you get smaller, right? If you were to zoom in, there would be no line here. You can't zoom in any farther. In general relativity, it's still continuous. This is known as uncountable. Right? You'll notice it looks the same, although the scale would just be modified for this straight line. General relativity is a continuous theory. All right? It assumes the universe is continuous. Now, we know the universe is not continuous for particles. But with gravity, it's, it's just weird because gravity, sort of our best rules of gravity, act on a continuum. And we can make a lot of predictions with general relativity that work with gravity being continuous on the scales we look at it. Now, to be fair, continuity is a good approximation of discreteness in some cases, right? So if you look at this, if this is the quantum mechanical part and there are 10 trillion of these lines, it's gonna look continuous, right? That's what this line represents. So the real question is, are we just looking at gravity on such a large scale that it appears continuous and is it fundamentally discrete? Uh, 
Investigations, all investigations into gravity thus far have shown that it is not discrete. Uh, so that is something that needs to be reconciled to answer what's going on in the Planck era. And, that's, and that will allow us to investigate times that are less than 10 to the minus 43 seconds and temperatures that are greater than 10 to the 32 Kelvin. All right? So this is the who knows era. Let's get to the maybe era. So the maybe era starts at the very ripe old age of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So to give you an idea of how small that is, say you were able to perceive, let's call it a poop. Let's say that one poop equals 10 to the minus 43 seconds. All right. Now keep in mind that in the entire age of the universe, there have been at most 10 to the 18th seconds, somewhere, somewhere in the 10 to the 17th realm. But no age of the universe exceeds 10 to the 18th seconds. All right? So that means that in one second, um, well, let, me, let me get out the calculator because this is some hard arithmetic. So that means that there have been 10 to the 25 poops or there are, if, if we're looking at, at poops here, there are 10 to the 25 more poops than, eight, than uh, seconds in the age of the universe. All right? I'm not going to write all that poop down. But that should give you an idea of how incredibly small this is. And I want you to notice that going from 10 to the minus 43rd to just 10 to the minus 38 seconds in this gut era, and again, this is, this we call this theoretical, not hypothetical, because the, the, the physics that depends on the predictions of this aspect of the universe occurring are very well grounded in experiments. All right. So the, the physics that says the gut era happened and looked like this are all consistent with the standard model. It requires nothing beyond, I mean, I guess that the, the technically it's beyond the standard model, but everything is, you know, what's experimentally verifiable. But this is all predictable stuff within, you know, currently well-established physics. So, and this is the era where gravity became distinct from the other forces. And the gut era is defined as when the temperature cool enough for the strong force to become distinct from the electro for, electro weak force. Now, this era, we can't get to the high end of it, but the electro weak era, we can't look and investigate 10 to the minus 38 seconds, but you better bet we can look at processes at 10 to the minus uh, 10 seconds. And in fact, the, close, the lowest time scale humans can investigate now is approximately... So uh, 10 to the minus um, 17 seconds, or 10 attoseconds, all right? So 10 to the minus 17 is about the limit of what we can do. It may be lower than that now. I'm not sure. But that is seven orders of magnitude smaller than 10 to the minus 10 seconds. And we can get temperatures slightly above 10 to the 15 Kelvin. So you better believe we can create this. We have created this in particle accelerators. Now, only for a really small volume, right? Very, very small volumes, but we can look at the universe as it looked in the electro. We can create little pockets of our current universe and recreate this electroweak era, of course, with many, many, many less atoms and a lot less energy than was after the Big Bang. But you'll notice this takes us to 10, from 10 to the minus 38 seconds to 10, a tenth of a nanosecond. All right, and the time here is, or the temperature drop is enormous from 10 to the 29th Kelvin to 10 to the 15th Kelvin. All right, now we can't, we can't see the high end of the electroweak era, but we can just, our instruments can just cross over this threshold into the electroweak era. All right, so in this era, we have um, an electroweak force and a strong force. Now, moving forward, 
we start to get to the particle era. All right, so in the particle era, this is where we have our four forces of nature. All right, and this lasts from one billionth of a second to one thousandth of one second. Now, if you're thinking, oh, well, now we're getting into normal stuff, here we cool down to a cool uh, trillion Kelvin, from, ten, from a quadrillion Kelvin to a trillion Kelvin. And I want you to think about this. See if you can start and stop a stopwatch in one thousandth of one second. You will find that you cannot do this. Uh, you will find that, it, that, that you maybe, maybe can do a hundredth of a second, but I even doubt that. Most human response time is six hundredths of one second. Um, so you can do it by, by tapping it all you want. Um, now, again, we talked about this earlier, but the amounts of matter and antimatter were nearly created equally. Again, this nearly comes from the fact that if you look around at your neighbors and your parents and your kids and or, you know, the walls in your house uh, or leaves outside or the air in the atmosphere, all of that is made of regular matter. All right. And according to models, in order to get the amount of matter we see roughly at the very minimum, basically one extra proton would have had to been created for every 10 to the ninth proton antiproton pairs. Now, let's talk about that. what that means in relatable terms. That means that every single proton, proton in your body, not cell, not molecule, but every proton, every single one, had only a one in one billion chance of surviving the initial uh, first millisecond of the universe. All right, one in one billion. If you look up the odds of winning the Powerball jackpot, they are much better. The, you are much far more likely to win the Powerball jackpot than to have one of your protons survive the uh, beginning of uh, the universe. All right, that is pretty incredible. Um, again, this is according to models that we look at, but again, when we look at how a universe should have formed, there's no reason to think that a universe should favor antimatter over matter. Now, I have thoughts, but I am not a particle physicist or cosmologist, so my ideas are crazy at best in this particular field. Um, and, uh, you know, well, they're crazy at worst, uh, and I don't have enough experimental background in the field to, you know, they, they could be good ideas, but I don't, I don't have the experimental design, and that's critically important. Uh, I'll remind you all my expertise is in quantum theory or quantum physics, so um, I try to contribute by designing devices that can measure things on very, very, very small scales. But as we can see here, according to our current models, uh, your, your atoms in your body are very, 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 very unlikely occurrences. So let's move on. Uh, we can see the era of nucleosynthesis begins from a millisecond to five minutes. So now, or at least in the minutes, we drop, though, another uh, thousand. Remember, 10 to the ninth is only one-tenth of one percent of 10 to the twelfth. All right? And so this began when matter uh, annihilates remaining antimatter at 0.1 second, and nuclei begin to fuse. All right? So this whole era only lasts five minutes. So to survive that first five minutes is a huge big deal. All right. And now basically the universe starts to cool from five minutes to 380,000 years. The universe is slowly cooling and rapidly ex or expanding and cooling. All right. And helium nuclei formed at about three minutes. So we got a lot of heat. We got about uh, helium in the, in this first part of the universe. Uh, and the universe became too cool to blast helium apart after three minutes, all right? So that cooling still rapidly going on, but its rate slowing substantially with time. Now, basically, the era of atoms is this dark age of the universe. That's 380,000 years to 1 billion years, all right? And the temperature goes from 3,000 to 20, all right? You'll notice that the Overall drop is is pretty it's still pretty steep, but it's not nearly as big percentage wise as um, as we as we as we've seen in, in previous parts of it. 
uh, we're only going from three orders of three to one, so we're only losing a hundred times instead of a thousand times. So atoms formed at about the age of 380,000 years, and that takes us to our baby picture of the universe. And that is when the background radiation is released. And the background radiation is one of the most single, most important uh, discoveries of the 20th century. Um, it won, a, it won very quickly won a Nobel Prize, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and um, it, it gives us almost entirely our information of experimental information of this time of the universe, this era of atoms. And many experiments have been made to more precisely measure the cost of the, the CMB and to measure it at different scales. Um, so the era of galaxies is one billion years to present. And the temperature has gone all the way from 10 to the 38 Kelvin to 3. But again, you'll notice the percentage drop, not that big. 30 is, we're talking from 1 1,000th, 1 one-tenth of 1% to about a 1% drop in the previous era. And here we only have, uh, we only lose, you know, about 90% instead of 99.99 or 99.9999% of our temperature. Uh, the first stars and galaxies formed by 1 billion. All right, but again, there's all sorts of information to be got, gotten from James Webb in that era of the universe. Okay, so what I want to do is we want to go and look at evidence for the Big Bang and understand the observations that lead us to these crazy conclusions that we see. Um, and we will, we will tackle that and other things. Uh, I'm going to do short breaks. Um, I will stop the video. I, you know, I'll leave the video because I think what we'll do is we'll do a 10 minute break. All right. Um, cause we might go, we might not be as early as I thought we would, but I, I kind of like the pace we're going with this. Um, and if you think this is fast, I'm thinking I've, I've slowed down quite a bit. So I have done this much faster in the past, but I think we're okay. So I'm just going to be away from the computer. I'm going to get some water. And so at, you know, 442 or four. 450, you know, or 452, 455, uh, we'll come back and we'll continue talking about the evidence for the Big Bang, okay? So I'm just going to be away, which means my mic and video will be off. I'll see you all in about 10 minutes.
Okay, I am back. And let's move forward for our evidence for the Big Bang. All right, so we want to look at the observations that lead physicists and astrophysicists to think that we have an idea of what happened at the beginning of the universe. All right. So when we look at the expansion of the universe as revealed by the Hubble diagram, basically we see that galaxies are moving away from us at a fairly uniform rate, right? We can see this expansion today in our telescopes. Um, so that's one. And we, we've already talked about that one. Now what we haven't talked about is that the cosmic microwave background radiation. That's this leftover radiation. This is a big one. This is probably the biggest one. Uh, and then third, the Big Bang Theory, we've designed it in a way to predict how much of the, uh, of the abundances of the universe of uh, helium and uh, light elements there should be in the universe. And the Big Bang Theory can correctly predict this number. All right, or in other words of saying is it actually predicted it before it was experimentally verified. Um, so, and again, verifying uh, atomic abundances requires very precise satellites and measurement techniques, uh, which hopefully some of your space mission papers will cover. Um, so let's go through and look at these. Now again, here's our baby universe. Uh, so we want to look at, we've already talked about how the expansion of the universe, our observed expansion, watching the galaxies move away from the Hubble diagrams, uh, you know, indicate that if you rewind the clock, everything should have been at the same point. But how do observations of the cosmic microwave background radiation support the Big Bang Theory? Well, let's learn a little bit about it and how it was made. These two gentlemen are the discoverers of the CMB. And this is one of those great physics stories because basically they developed their horn, their antenna, and um, and this was detected in night. The CMB was detected in 1965, um, and so basically, uh, what happened is is they kept getting this noise signal in their data, and they kept trying to get rid of the noise signal, and they were very much convinced. After, after very carefully uh, eliminating uh, ex, um, instrumentation error from their, um, from their, uh, you know, the results, they came to the very astonishing and deep conclusion that bird droppings were responsible for uh, the error. And so they had graduate students, I'm sure, scrubbing their antenna array to reduce the amount of constant bird poop as pigeons were constantly on their array. And so it was a race against birds uh, until someone came and looked at their data and, um, and said, wait a minute, this is exactly what the, the CMB prediction looks like. And then they looked into that and by, quite by accident discovered that they didn't have bird poop on their array, but they had, uh, or at least bird poop wasn't causing their noise. It was this cosmic microwave background radiation. And they figured it had to be in the antenna because it didn't matter where they pointed it, the noise was always there. So you basically, when you look at this cosmic microwave background radiation, it comes and looks at and looks the same wherever you point your array, your uh, antenna. All right. And the mechanism of it where it gets us that baby picture of the universe is that the CMB would have been released at this very specific instant. All right. When nuclei were bound. Uh, and scattering into atoms, once all those electrons got locked in, that created a tremendous amount of space in between the atoms, and the light was free to flow uninterrupted. All right? It wasn't being scattered and redirected. And once it could flow freely, it could be seen. And now as the universe has expanded, that radiation has expanded with the universe. All right? So the background radiation from the Big Bang was freely streaming since the atoms formed at a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin, all right, visible in the infrared. Now again, we can sort of see this process happen going from post 3,000 to 3,000 Kelvin, that gives us the temperature, right? 
And then we can see how long, what the, the wavelength is now and figure out how long it's been stretched since 380,000 years. And that gives us uh, our indication. Now, uh, the, it, the, what you're looking at here is data and we have uh, the observed spectrum of the cosmic microwave background radiation, right, at its peak here at about 1. I guess, one na uh, millimeters. And you'll notice that here you have your temperature spectrum. These dots are the actual data taken. And what I want you to notice is that the straight line is the theoretical model predicted by the Big Bang. And you'll notice that there is little to absolutely no deviation here. This is a very good match, right? So, uh, and it has the, so 2.73, 2.73 should be here. So this peak is, oh no, this is a temperature. That's the wavelength for that temperature. Got it, okay. So this peaks here with this wavelength will peak at about 2.73 Kelvin. And uh, the expansion of the universe has redshifted thermal radiation from that time to 1,000 times longer, which makes it from visible into microwaves. Uh, so this allows us to get an idea of how long it's been since the radiation was emitted. All right? And that's just by looking at the stretch frequency of it. Uh, the Planck satellite, which I said we need sophisticated satellites, the Planck satellite gives us this very detailed baby picture of the universe. And again, it looks like it's non-uniform, but these represent very small uh, changes in uh, uniformity. All right. Um, we'll look at all that a little more in a little bit. Um, so the Big Bang theory predicts that there should be about uh, one hydrogen or one helium for every uh, four hydrogens, or that the universe should be about 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. And you'll notice if you count uh, during uh, helium synthesis, after helium synthesis, you get this much left, and we can we can see that that's about you know analysis of intergalactic space and large scale structure of the universe will give us spectra that indicates that that is the correct um, distribution of atoms. So we already saw how that happens, uh, and we have the result right here: seventy five percent hydrogen, twenty five percent helium. Uh, and it matches these observations of uh, nearly primordial gases or early gases. All right. So that's what we see from the CMB. And now we want to talk about inflation. So inflation is kind of a hard pill to swallow because, again, it's a idea that answers a lot of questions and a better explanation does not exist currently. That doesn't mean there isn't one. It just means we don't have it today. Um, so that's what's behind this question. Did inflation really occur? Signs point to yes, but again, we have to see. So key features of the universe are explained by inflation. Why is this such a compelling idea? That's what we have to know. Told you it's compelling. So we notice that the universe ha does have structure. All right, where does the structure come from? Why is the overall distribution of matter so uniform? And why is the density of the universe so close to what we'll call the critical density? This critical density refers to the shape of the universe being uh, either closed or infinitely open. And right now it's at this critical density, which means it's flat. And it's, it's extremely close to this critical density, uh, like one part in 10 to the, into the, it's, uh, they say it in space time. Um, I don't want to give a wrong number here, but it's extremely close. Like by a teeny tiny amount. We're talking 10 to the 9th, 10th, 11, or possibly 12th. I think it's 10 to the 12th. But that being said, inflation will actually answer all of these questions. And there's no better explanation that gets rid of all three of these outstanding questions that you don't have without it. If you take away the episode of inflation, you have three very different mysteries of the universe that have no explanation. Now you have one mysterious object, this early episode of inflation, right? But now you have, to, to sort of paraphrase Bender from Futurama, now instead of having three things, you have one thing you need to explain. If you accept that this happened, 
right? All three of these can be accounted for, all three of these observations. So, um, so that's kind of what we do. Now, inflation can make a structure or can make structure by stretching tiny quantum ripples in size to enormous sizes. These ripples then become the seeds for all structure in the universe. So remember what I told you about stuff popping into and out of existence? That's what's meant by a quantum ripple or quantum fluctuation. So basically, if you are massive enough, if you have enough mass when you form, that will trigger expansion and then you can't recollapse. So think of it this way. Basically, when matter pops out from nothing, what happens is, is that you get uh, the vacuum creates a particle-antiparticle pair, and then in a very, very short amount of time, and I'm talking like, you know, sub second timeline, they pop into existence and out of existence, all right? So they pop in, and then they, so first there's nothing, they pop into existence, and then they collapse back into nothing, all right? The net energy of this process is zero. That's why you don't see flashes of, of this happening all the time, even though it's happening everywhere. Uh, now, if you're big enough and you pop big masses into and out of existence, right, positive and negative, the idea is, is that this expansion starts and the expansion V of expansion is greater than the speed of light. That means that these two masses are no longer causally connected anymore. All right, remember we talked about causality? That means information can no longer go from one to the other and they stay, they stay existing in the universe. And that this inflation can stretch and move these, these, uh, these objects out, these quantum fluctuations and create our structure. This is also thought to exist because when you look at the small scale of the universe, when you look at what's called quantum foam, all the weird quantum stuff that happens, and sort of look at it at a large scale, it looks strikingly like the universe at the, big, at the largest scales. In fact, eerily like the universe at the largest scales. Um, now, young people will take all sorts of substances and go, well, maybe we are foam, there's universes in our foam. That could be true. But, you know, you might want to pull back from your uh, existential experience for a minute there and just stick with the observation, which is that they are startlingly, startlingly similar in appearance. So in that sense, it's consistent, our observation that the quantum foam, or the when we look at the quantum physics at the smallest scale, looks like the universe at the largest scale, If you if you look at that the large-scale universe is just an expanded, inflated, small quantum structure. That's another thing that gives me pause for a while, because there's, there's a lot of tantalizing possibilities in all of this. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, that range from getting why we can't, you know, understanding where we could come from from nothing um, to maybe we repeat over and over again, or there are slight, you know, this is where you start to really start thinking about, you know, you know, you start so you start to hypothesize or speculate beyond our own current uh, our own current um, universe, and you start to think about the structure of existence, right? And uh, and that's where brains. I mean, that's where my brain starts to hurt. If you're curious, um, and I like to and have been thinking about that for a long, long, long time, um, but. It's kind of just, it's it's still, even after all these years, it's still extremely mind-blowing. It's like, that's, you know, that it could be this way, developing experiments to figure it out or to get insight. Oh, that's what we do. And that's where, where that's where the field still is today and why it's very exciting. Um, now, of course, we're only talking about the universe in terms of observed matter. Um, we're going to get much more... Uh, talk about much more interesting or exotic matter um, next week when we talk about dark matter and dark energy. Uh, so all this crazy stuff just explains the universe we see. There's the universe we know out there that we don't see that we also need to explain. Uh, it's all incredibly, incredibly fascinating. Um, 
So moving on from our quantum fluctuation slide, um, I think I think the black hole slide are two of the most, um, you know, let's slip it by and see if they don't ask questions um, slides I've ever seen in my life. But that's okay. We can go. We can go forward. All right. So looking at that, so how can microwave temperatures be nearly identical to opposite ends of the sky? Basically, the thought is, is when we look at microwave temperatures from one end of the sky to the other, they're not just close, they're almost exactly the same. And the idea is, is that even though they might not be causally connected today, uh, and if they remain always not been causally connected, meaning information can't get from one to the other, that doesn't make sense that everything should be so uniform. Right? The only way they could be uniform is if they were so close together that they essentially formed in the same, in the same space during the same type of uh, event. And that in order to be so far apart, right, they would have had to have undergone tremendous amounts of expansion or inflation. So uh, inflation explains that temperature uniformity. And uh, regions now on opposite ends of the sky must have been close together and inflation pushed them far apart. Okay, and we see the microwaves from each one that come to us. Because again, remember that the light spherically transmit, transmits out. And that we only see this part of it here. That's the part that gets, gets to us. Okay? So when we talk about critical, we talk about geometry. When we talk about geometry, we're talking about space time. So the universe appears to be very, very nearly flat. And in fact, to the best of our measurement abilities, it is essentially flat. Um, Space Time did a very good episode on this, that it's flat to the point that if you make a, um, if you imagine a bowling alley, right, as far as curved deviations and curvature, uh, even, even if uh, the universe is flat enough that if you were to uh, bowl, you know, take a bowling ball and bowl to Alpha Centauri, it's so flat that it would stay in the middle all four of those light years, all right? And, and curvature, the curvature of the, uh, of, of the law of, laner, uh, of the lane is what will cause the bowling ball to sort of wiggle and wobble and get out of its lane or be out of that central pin. And uh, in terms of density, it appears we're in this very flat geometry universe overarching structure. Now, if the density is greater than the critical density or it has positive curvature, positive density, we have a closed spherical universe. That means if you get from one side, you'd come right back to the other. If the density is less than critical, you have this open, clearly infinite universe, the saddle universe that just goes on forever. Now, the critical universe is thought to be infinite, and that's one of the main, because we're so close to this critical value, that's why the conclusion is often drawn that we are a infinite universe. Um, now again, a lot of questions, how does something infinite in size sort of come from something not infinite in size? What does that mean for the edge of the universe? Does it make sense to talk about an edge to the universe? These are all very good questions um, that uh, more study is required for than we will, we will get to in the, in the course. Uh, and again, not all of these have answers, right? They have the theory and the experiments take you so far but then you get to a place where, where you run out of uh, uh, conclusive answers, where there's not room for argumentation. And so this is where we are. These are the kinds of questions we ask today. All right. Um, so the inflation of the universe flattens the overall geometry, like the inflation of a balloon will cause, you'll notice that you have this ant on a balloon. As the balloon gets bigger, it can appear flat. All right. And the curvature we see in space-time is due to mass, local masses and galaxies causing ripples in this overall flat space time. Okay? Now, did inflation occur? Um, this is one of those important diagrams uh, where you might be wondering, well, it, you know, all the data fits, but it doesn't really seem to fit here at large angles. Uh, but that's not really the point here. We have the relative size of temperature fluctuations and you'll notice that even though there are large error bars here, the fluctuations are small for large angles. All right? And we get that we have temperature differences are greatest between patches separated by about one degree. All right? And, um, 
and that's that's where we see uh, large but still very small fluctuations and this is angular separation in the sky all right um, basically what you can do um, the patterns and structures we observe show us the uh, angle of the universe now to get the density it's actually a pretty simple calculation you pick oh no I didn't want to do that I wanted my line you pick any three points on this diagram and you make a triangle all right so let's go here Basically, you do this in the night sky with your data, and you add up the angles to this triangle. If you get 180 degrees, you're in a flat space, exactly. If you get less than 180 degrees, you are in a um, in negative curvature, I believe, and if, you get, and if you get greater than 180 degrees, you're in a closed positive curvature space. So you can do that just by looking at the properties of your triangle, right? All of the angles should add up to 180 degrees in a flat space. And what we find here is that they make the separation. I can't even do a one degree separation because it's, it's really that small. I'll give it a shot though. But we find in the sky that when we, when we make this very small angle, that's where we'll get the greatest relative disparity at this one degree angle, which is itself a small angle. All right, and that's how they that's how they analyze this stuff. They draw these triangles on the cosmic microwave background. They add them up, and the uh, geometry is implied by the properties of the triangle, and that's just what we know from geometry. Okay. So basically, all of these observations are consistent with inflation, and um, basically, I don't cover this part because it's the astrophysics people have told me it's it's not particularly useful and it's it's just time not spent. What I'd rather do is answer questions and talk about things uh, that may um, that, like I said, uh, uh, may have come up. So I'll open it up for questions and then. Uh, I'll answer questions about the class when I've stopped recording. So, but I want to be sure I, I answer any questions you might have about what we've seen uh, in class. So, class time questions I'll answer, stop recording, and then I'll answer questions like about quizzes and last days and stuff that you might have. Um, okay. And I'm going to take a picture of the. Um, I'm going to take a picture of the uh, attendance. All right. All right, picture taken. All right, I'll get to those in a minute, to the questions regarding the quizzes. But any questions regarding this stuff? Well, it's okay if there's none. I guess you have to let it marinate for a while. Like I said, I've been marinating with it for almost two decades, so um, it's still kind of just mind-blowing. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording.